Joshua chapter 9 is a curious story. In some Bibles it's called the Gibeonite Deception. See, there's two kinds of military strategy. One is basically from the outside and the other is from the inside. And at the beginning of chapter 9, you see an outside one. Uh, when all the kings who are on this side of the Jordan heard about Jericho, they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. So it's your basic head-to-head -head confrontation. You gather all your troops and you go fight them all together. But then there's another technique, the sort of fifth column idea. And verses 3 to 6 tells you about that. But the Gibeonites, who lived just up the road here, they worked craftily. And they sent ambassadors to Israel, pretending to be from a far country. And look at the methods. They, worked, they used this word craftily. They misrepresented themselves. They pretended to be from a foreign country. And they even gave false evidence of that deception. They put dust on their clothes and they put old dry mouldy bread in their, in their, in their uh, bags and then wine bottles were old and cracked and they did a little routine and, oh we've come such a long way, where are you from? Oh it's a long way away, we've heard about the great things about Israel, we've come to make a covenant with you. So oh no we don't make covenants with people, we're here on the Lord's business, this is the Lord's land. So oh yeah but we've come from a long long way away. So they fooled them. We've heard of the wonderful name of the Lord. They, they, they seduce them, they con them into thinking they're something that they're not. And Joshua and the leaders of Israel accept the deception of the Gibeonites. It says in verses 14 and 15 something very interesting. It says, they did not inquire of the Lord. They did not ask counsel of the Lord. And sometimes, especially when you're doing very well as a Christian, you make this fatal error, don't you? It could just be me. I'm, okay, I make this fatal error. Everything is going along swimmingly, coasting along. And so it's at that point that I fail to ask of the Lord what he's saying about a certain situation. Maybe I've done something so many times it seems like I'm flowing with it. But God requires, as Paul said, every thought to be brought captive to the Lord. He wasn't talking about mind control, he was talking about real relationship. And at this vital point, the Israelites fail. They fail again. They fail to ask counsel of the Lord. And when the trickery is exposed, as it surely will be, they say, wait a minute, the Gibeonites aren't from miles away, they're from up the road. We've made a solemn covenant not to attack these people. When we promised the Lord, we would attack, we'd clean out this land of all the people who worship foreign gods. But because they've made this solemn pact, a bit weird, isn't it? A bit of a twisted concept. We, we promised before God we won't attack them, so we can't attack them. And everyone's angry about this. But Joshua said, well, what's done is done. So they made peace with them. The deception's uncovered. And even though the congregation of Israel murmurs, as it says, against the leaders, they keep their promise okay and it says in psalm 15 he honors those who fear the lord who swears to his own hurt and does not change there's something valuable in being consistent of doing what you say you're going to do and later in 2 samuel 21 king saul actually broke the covenant with the gibeonites and they uh, the, the thinkers of the day said that the famine that ensued in Israel was a punishment because he'd broken a covenant made between Joshua and the Gibeonites. And significantly, there's no complaint from the Gibeonites. So, said, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. So Joshua's trying to find an angle on this, so he says, right, we've made a covenant with you, but we are not equal in this covenant, you're going to be our slaves. And they said, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. They said, you're going to be water carriers and woodcutters for the house of the Lord. Whatever you say, whatever you say, we, we are in your hands, do with us, as seems good and right to you. And they found their way in. They found their way in through a little loophole into the covenant of the Lord. The ones who were outsiders are now insiders. And Gibeonites are now counted among the people of Israel. Because God 
always has a heart for outsiders. He always has a heart, a feeling for fringe people. Have you ever noticed that? When you think you've got it nicely sewn up, it's a bit like the story of Rahab in chapter 2. Here's a woman of poor reputation living in the middle of the enemy camp and yet she sees the coming of the people of Israel. She acknowledges that God is with them and she makes her future with them and she finds a loophole. She finds her loophole into the covenant of God and when the whole of the city is destroyed, she's rescued and she even becomes part of the genealogy of Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 1. So there you go. They become servants of the uh, tabernacle, just as Joshua had commanded. And Gibeon itself becomes a priestly city. And later, the Ark of the Covenant rests there in the days of David and Solomon, according to 1 Chronicles 16. And God speaks to Solomon it, at Gibeon itself. And Gibeonites, years and years later, are with Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So this is what God does with people who are sinners, but who, who come to him. Even if you feel yourself excluded or an outsider, God has lots of surprises. I started off looking at chapter 9 thinking this simple thought, do not make friends with your enemy. But as I went on pondering on Joshua chapter 9, I realised that God has surprises on who is my enemy. And that even my enemy, <laughs> there are loopholes into grace. When we take it upon ourselves to exclude people. Do you remember that strange thing that Jesus said about men of violence take the kingdom by force? They force their way in. Maybe the Gibeonites force their way in. Just like those guys carrying a stretcher with their dear friend. And they force their way in through the roof and lower him to the feet of Jesus. And the one who is the total outsider in the crowd is now centre stage. And Jesus says... Your sins are forgiven, your body is healed. You are now part, so to speak, of the covenant of grace. Do you like that? May God bless us with this wonderful truth that you can never be totally excluded from grace, that God has a plan for you, even if you feel awkward and strange and far outside the covenant. God has a loophole with your name on it, Find your way to where he is. And may you be blessed. Amen.